Hello and welcome to the Bearded Tits podcast. I'm your host Jack Perks and today I'm going to be talking to wildlife artist Robert E. Fuller. He has produced some stunning work over the years and is particularly known for his work with mustelids in his own garden such as weasels and stoats. However we're going to cover the news first. So this news story caught my eye. It is about an aquatic beetle that survives being swallowed alive by frogs. Now I've heard recently that carp eggs can actually survive going through the digestive tract of mallards and that's one theory as to how some fish will end up in ponds in the middle of nowhere. That ducks eat them and a small percentage of eggs survive but they can proliferate from that. Um, I still think it's mostly people chucking fish in ponds but that has been proven that carp, some carp eggs can survive but more recently a beetle has shown to be surviving through frogs. So the Asian aquatic beetle named, oh god I'm going to have a go at this scientific name, Regimbatia atenatua, sounds like a Harry Potter spell, uh, I can't quite say that, but anyway these beetles are very very hard and 90% of swallowed beetles were excreted within 6 hours of being eaten and surprisingly were still alive, so 90% is a huge amount to, uh, to actually survive that. The beetle's tough protective exoskeleton helps as does a bubble of air trapped under its wing case which allows it to breathe but there's much more to it than that. While dead material takes more than a day to travel through the length of the gut, one beetle managed to cover the distance in just six minutes so they power through the frog to get out of there so that's incredible that they've developed this really nifty way of surviving being eaten which most animals don't get to do. Let's talk about our guest anyway, Robert E. Fuller, incredible wildlife artist, appeared on, on various nature programmes, so I was really pleased to have him on the podcast. We talk a little bit about the work that he does, some of his background as an artist, and some tips and hints if you want to get into wildlife art yourself. So here's our chat. Well, thanks for joining me, Rob. No problem. Do you prefer Rob or Robert, actually? Uh, Rob's fine, yeah. Rob's, I, okay. I get too, yeah. too familiar with shortening names my name's jack so i can't really shorten that any more down to no. you know, J, J or <laughs> something it. like that um well you're the first yeah. artist we've had on so I'm, I'm really looking forward to this just to kind of look at the process mm -hmm. uh behind it all so i'm going to start with what you're yeah. most well associated with which is the mustelids in your garden uh, particularly stoats and weasels yes. um, and the setups that you've created yeah. so where did all that start it sort of starts every year. I, I sort of try and set myself a challenge of uh, filming a new subject and actually, you know, almost dedicating that whole year to that one subject. Uh, other little bits of wildlife fit in, uh, but it's not until you actually spend a lot of time with animal, these animals, you actually get to real grips with them uh, and understand them. And I kept in the back of my mind, it was just really niggling me, uh, stoats and weasels. I kept seeing them passing through my garden. I'd grab a camera. I'll try and get them out of the window, I'll try and go outside and I never ever have got a decent uh, photograph of a stoat or a weasel up until six years ago and uh, I spotted this female weasel out in the studio window uh, just hunting and I just thought, I just wondered if that could be the next sort of project. Now that project has then ended up lasting six years <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I got totally obsessed and immersed with the, the wild stoats and weasels in my garden and trying to understand them, I understand who's related to who, the family history. The only problem I've got is stoats can kill weasels, and uh, that's one of their biggest, biggest sort of predators is uh, stoats uh, taking the weasels. So most of the weasels I've had living in my garden, I would say, ninety percent of them have ended up being predated by the stoats, uh, which is a real right? shame. I absolutely love both. So the habitats that I've designed for the uh, weasels uh, where I've got you know actually built nesting chambers uh, and feeding boxes and things uh, they've all got very small holes so the stoats are able to get in but we've literally covered this whole area with cameras so I can see you know when the stoats are arriving from the hedge lines uh, in this sort of beautiful landscape that we have here so I know when they come in I spot them on camera I know which camera they're going to go to next and then I've got a network of hides uh, in the garden, which some actually have a tunnel underground from the living room, uh, a six metre long tunnel. 
that I go through to get into a, uh, a hive. In there, I've got monitors so I can see what's happening with the stoats uh, or the weasels and then actually start filming and photographing them. And I've probably now uh, got the biggest bank of wild stone weasel footage and photographs of anyone in the world, I should think, because uh, that's just literally been my life for six years, well, as well as painting. <laughs> yeah, well, there's not a lot, is there? If you if you kind of Google uh, weasel weasel images particularly, I know there's a little bit more of Stoke, but not a huge amount. They're, they're not an easy subject to work, you know, as you can well attest, they're not an easy subject to work yeah. with. So what you've achieved yeah. is um, is bonkers, really. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. The proper tricky, and the more the more little nuggets of information I've found out. You know, I've filmed both steep stoats and weasels mating in the nest. I nearly filmed one giving birth last year, but a male stoat kept going in and pestering her uh, and rumbling her around uh, because after she's given birth, uh, she'll actually come into season straight away. And she was then actually mated a week later. Uh, she was avoiding them uh, and he actually pushed her out of the nest chamber where she was going to give birth uh, yeah. three days before she gave birth. Well, she actually gave birth about four metres away from where I'm stood now underneath a, a flat roof under some decking here. <laughs> so, so she didn't give birth on camera, but she gave birth just a few metres away from where I paint every day. And uh, so that was pretty special in itself. She was just hidden away from the cameras, which was quite frustrating. Yeah, and everyone's probably going to ask you this, but what's the difference between a, a stoat and a weasel? I know st uh, weasels are smaller, is that right? Yeah, yeah, weasels are much smaller, and it's probably the most um, uh, mis mislabeled species, the stoat and the weasel. You know, I look on websites, I look in books, and it says, and magazines, and they say, I'll go here to see stoats, and then they put a picture of a weasel in. So, very, very simple. Uh, a stoat has a black tip on its tail and a weasel has a short little tail and weasels are you know they're much smaller but the difference in size between a female weasel and a male weasel is more than double the weight sometimes so a big a big weasel um, uh, you know it's not as big as a small stoat but the size you know a small female stoat you know she might be 200 and some grams and uh, but the male sort of a weasel will be about 130, 140. So there's still 100 grams difference, you know, nearly, it's not double, but uh, yeah, so when you just see them scurrying around, I always say, if you see it scurrying across the road in front of you, which is what people often see, a weasel is almost like a, two sausages <laughs> put together. And they scurry very flat in motion. Uh, and stoats can sometimes have a very boundy, uh, sort of movement arching their back, especially when they're in sort of more playful modes. But they they pronk a lot a lot more. Whereas a weasel running, literally, it's like ping. <laughs> it's just they're just running quite a straight, straight fast line. Whereas there's more movement within a a stoat that's running fast. They bound a lot more. Uh, oh, but it's the black yeah. tip on the tail that always gives it away. If you don't see the black tip of the tail, you often see headshots in magazines. Weasels have a lovely little cheek marks under here. Uh, so there, there's a white area around here, and then they have little cheek marks uh, under their under their chin here. And weasels always have this. And if we're going to get really technical, the uh, the line in between the pale belly and the brown upper uh, is always straight in a stout, and that's always jagged in a weasel in this country. Um. That's not true of Ireland, but in this country, so <laughs> there's quite a few differences between them. And yeah. uh, I find it frustrating when, you know, there's, uh, you know, like the Woodland Trust or one of the big organisations mis mislabeling them. And I've found it on websites so many times, books, magazines. And uh, it's like if we've got to educate people as to which is which, really. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's got to be done properly, really. No, it's one of my pet peeves if I'm around a nature reserve yeah. or something and you see a notice board. And it'll have something misidentified. You're just face palming, like oh, for God's sake! You know? So uh, I feel, I feel your pain there. Um, yeah. Do you tend to paint from a reference image then, or is it more in your mind's eye? A little bit of both. So um, you know, I see things sort of happening out there with nature, and I just try and work out how I can recreate that. Sometimes, um, and then other times, you know, I'll, I'll use an actual photograph or an image grab from a video. And uh, this is a natural Kestrel that I've studied this year. 
uh, behind me on the drawing board. So I'm painting her, I'm not just painting a kestrel. So I'm, I'm really sort of concentrating on getting her perfect. Uh, and it's that individual animal and that's what I like doing with the stoats and the weasels I paint. They're all individual animals that are now, and they've all got names. It's a little bit silly. Some people don't like to name wild, you know, don't like to name wildlife. But to me, if I don't name the wildlife, it's just like another stoat. And I've had uh, 40 stoats in the garden that I've, you know, have identified. Uh, and there's been a few more that are not sort of recorded properly, but I know them all by their facial markings. Um, so they're all individual animals. Bandita, she's, uh, one of the most famous stoats in the world. I think she's uh, been on a natural world program that then, then has been seen across the world uh, in America, Canada, Mexico, Europe. Um, so that was a co-produced program uh, with CBS in America. And, uh, and so that's, that's sort of gone global, but she's, she's still with us now. And she was born 2016. Uh, she was born in just near one of my habitats and I moved into one of my habitats and I uh, saw her yesterday morning. So she's a, a very special stoat and she's due to go home in any, any time now. Oh, that'd be amazing. I've never seen... I've, 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 yeah, in a few months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. never know, do you? I've never seen a, a, an ermine, yeah. a, white, a white stoat, but we do occasionally get them, don't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's get, getting less and less common. She's the only ermine stoat that I've had in the garden that I know. Um, her brother started going home and half his tail went home and he, went, he was going home and round the face uh, and starting up round his belly onto his shoulders but he never he never went, went fully home and, and Bandita, she's called Bandita because she retains a, a little mask around her eyes of dark <laughs> like a little bandit <laughs> Okay, yeah. oh great So is there a subject that's particularly hard to paint then? I imagine the detail can be incredibly tricky on, on some species yeah, there, there is. Yeah, I mean, some of the easiest things to paint sometimes are the most complex. So things like uh, zebras, uh, you know, are going further afield than where yeah, we live here yeah, now. Yeah, not, not, not in your garden. Painting. Not in my garden. I've been to Africa <laughs> 13 times now. So, uh, you know, I've been very lucky to be able to travel to these amazing places. But in my garden, yeah, stoats and weasels are quite tricky because uh, the more animals are just one one colour or two colours, they're more difficult. So you've got the kestrel here on the drawing board behind me. That's easy because we've got all of the markings, the patination uh, to concentrate on. Whereas if you've got a stout that's like more than half brownie ginger, you've then got to make that look nice and three dimensional. So those subjects, the ones that look easier are sometimes actually harder to capture in a way. Yeah, I know, because I suppose you've, you've got to have a hundred, you know, not a hundred, but twenty or thirty different shades of ginger, haven't you? And you've got to make it look yeah, that's it. Uh, convincing. That's exactly it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so how long does it take you to produce a painting? Because I know some artists who can just raffle them out, and then other artists will take you know x amount of time. So, uh, I know it's it's probably a, a tricky question because it depends on each one. But typically, how long does it take yeah. you to? So, say the kestrel behind you, for example. How long did that take to do? Yeah, so that would be. Um... Sometimes the bigger ones are not too bad, but this will be more than three weeks work, this one. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I don't really rattle paintings out of this size. Potentially I could do, but you wouldn't get a painting like this. You know, um, watercolourists are, are much faster, faster medium. Um, and, you know, I don't try and, you know, get too laborious with my paintings sometimes and spend loads of time. Uh, but I've got one that is seriously challenging me. I, I've got one of tree sparrows here, and this has uh, got 19, 19 tree sparrows, all very detailed. Yeah, yeah. And it's going to have a lot of blossom on here and things. Now that's going <laughs> to, that's taken, that's taken forever. I haven't even added up the time. I have absolutely no idea. I've been working on it uh, a lot of this year. It's a commission for someone. And uh, yeah, very challenging picture to do this on. So I photographed all these sparrows. Um, in little groups or individually out in the studio window. They're all out there now chattering away. Um, so, so, so ones like that, yeah, that's, that's going to take me a long, long time. But, uh, you know, it could be eight weeks, eight weeks work that one. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, sort of big, bold paintings don't necessarily take as long as little detail, detailed ones. It's, 
you've got to imagine the amount of brush strokes that you're putting in. And if you've got something bigger and bolder, um, it might look as if it's taking loads more time, but in actual fact, something like that will take a lot more time than something like this. Yeah, no, that yeah. that makes sense. I see, I see what you're saying. And well, I'm going to ask what your favourite subject is to work on. I suspect I know the answer, but I'll ask it anyway. <laughs> what What is your favourite subject to work on? Oh God, I don't have a f I don't, to actually paint. I don't actually have yeah, a favourite. You don't. Oh, that's a cop sounds out. Sounds terrible. Isn't <laughs> it? Yeah, it's a total cop out, isn't it? Um, I think. I've painted more badges than any other animal that I've painted, I should think. Uh, and and roe deer, I just love roe deer and the the um, the sort of shapes and the lines that the they're, they're the prettiest the deer, aren't they? Yeah, I, 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 by far. Yeah, I mean, if I see roe deer, I'll go to a lot of effort to get close to them and study them. If I see red deer, I'll go to a lot of effort. If I see a fallow deer or a seeker deer or one of the other uh, munchaks or the other deers. <laughs> I don't know, I, I, they just don't do it for me. The roe deer are so special and so pretty. And, uh, you know, the, you can't beat being in a highland glen with a with a, a rut going on around you and all the roaring. Um, yeah. But it's those, yeah, and, and the simplicity of badges as well, the black and white, I absolutely love, um, you know, I, I love doing the badges and uh, I've watched them for years as well. So it's not only the stoats and the weasels, uh, it's badgers, otters, pine martins when I get up to Scotland. Yeah, I just, yeah. It's the muscular family in particular, so I do like all of the muscular family and painting those and studying them. And it's the ones that, in a way, the, the subjects that are hardest to study that I get most reward from. I, I study barn owls a lot. I've got 150 nest boxes that I've put up for barn owls. So I do a lot of work with barn owls as well. But because stoats are so stoats and weasels are so tricky, and no one else has achieved, um, you know, in the way what I've achieved with them, being able to film them throughout the year, and um, when they're young, the breeding cycle, and things. Uh, that's what I'm sort of probably most well known for. But I, I, I love all British wildlife. Kingfishers love kingfishers. Yeah, you can't beat um, the electric blue, can you? Yeah. Yeah, and there's such cheeky things as well, you know, during the breeding season, the whole, um, you know, the whole sort of breeding cycle, because they don't really particularly like each other at the beginning of the year at all, and they've got to come together to breed, they're quite feisty, territorial, and just watching that process as they gradually sort of calm down and then start doing the fish passes, um, it's uh, absolutely fascinating, the kingfishers as well. So I've been lucky enough to film them in the nest. Uh, as well a few times actually in this chamber which is uh, yeah that's sort of that's absolutely well up there with uh, the things that I've done. Uh, that's that's the, close to home for you again is it? No this is 10 miles away. Oh is I, it? I live okay. high up on the yeah yeah no. I don't live near any water. No. If, if I had this place perfect I'd have a uh, I live high up on the Yorkshire Wells beautiful scenery grasslands with lots of wildflowers uh, if I had it perfect, I think I'd have a va uh, valley, uh, lots of valleys here. Need a river running down a valley. I'd need a lake. Just over here would be nice to have a quarry. And yeah. um, I've got a little wood at the back here that I've planted myself, which is coming on really well. But I think I'd have like a forest out in the back, and maybe a wetland somewhere as well, and maybe the sea, not, the sea a bit closer as well. Yeah, not not. <laughs> and then that'd be perfect, wouldn't it? Don't ask, don't ask <laughs> for much then. <laughs> Uh, I mean, this is a really special place, but that's the only frustration. When I moved somewhere, I always thought I'd be nearer water than I am now, and uh, in the river system or some streams. Um, yeah. Yeah, obviously in touch with the water and the river systems and yeah. things there with your work. Yeah, definitely. I don't. I, I used to live a five minute walk from a river and I've mo I moved house about three months ago, so I'm a little bit further away. Now, there is a canal not too far away, but it's not quite the same as a, as a nice river. Yeah. So, yeah, but it's not too bad. You, you've looked after quite a few wild animals in your time as well, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, uh, since a little boy, I've been looking after sort of wild animals. And uh, over the years, I've obviously got better and better of it. And uh, it's a case of then trying to get those wild animals back into the wild. And that, that over the rehabilitation process to actually have a success story at the end of it is probably the most crucial and the most difficult bit in a way, because... 
it's very time consuming raising little baby animals. Uh, so I, I do some of it myself. I work with other people, uh, rehabilitation centers, and uh, often my job is to get those animals back into the wild successfully. And uh, yeah, it can be tricky. So I do a lot of surrogacy work. So I surrogate uh, some owl chicks into other owl nests and uh, kestrels. Uh, I do it with those species as well, so tawny owls, barn owls. And uh, you know, it's amazing what is possible with some species uh, that the owls, you know, the wise old owl isn't actually that wise, that they'll accept, readily accept uh, chicks from other nests. And I, I, I work 90%, more than 90% of the time, I want people just to leave the wildlife where it is. And, uh, you know, that's where it actually belongs in the wild. There's a little tawny owl on the floor looking at helpless, a little chick. It's just completely normal behavior. Every tawny owl chick fledges too early. Every tawny owl chick ends up on the floor and every tawny owl chick ends up looking wet at some stage. And that's just nature. That's how tawny owls live. Uh, and people often pick them up. Uh, and the problem that we have is people will take them into a vet, drop them off at the vets. They don't leave a name and address. So we don't know where this owl has come from. So there's owls I get in those circumstances so if someone rings me, I say, just leave it. If it's not injured, you know, if the, you're always at risk when you pick up an owl chick as well with a tawny owl that they can come and uh, attack you. Uh, the parents and I have been attacked many times by the owls that live here because they know me so well and it hurts. <laughs> so, so you've got to be really cautious with tawny owls and picking those chicks up and getting them up off the ground. There always almost needs to be two of you there rather than doing it on your own because they come in so fast and uh, most of them won't bother you at all but when they do come in you hear a rush of wings and your temptation is to turn around and you know um, Eric Hoskins obviously lost an eye by a tawny owl so they're quite formidable things. Is that right? Quite, I didn't know that. Yeah 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 so they're quite uh, yeah I mean I've had some you know quite nasty injuries from tawny owls and I go with a leather hat on and a visor and uh, I thought one day, well, I'll just put some buffs on my neck. And the tawny owl knew I had a leather hat on and a visor. And it then went for my uh, neck. Now, if it hits one of these veins with those dirty talons, yeah. it can be in trouble quite quickly. You know, I had blood poisoning from being bitten by a weasel. <laughs> oh my things God. like that. <laughs> the, it, it tracked up to my shoulder, the, uh, the infection. And uh, I was told to go to the doctors immediately. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so so uh, you, you've got to be careful of the wildlife and yeah. respectful of it. But I, I love doing the getting the birds back into the wild and the animals. I do it with stoats and weasels, and because we've got so many cameras around and cameras in the nest that we're doing this surrogacy work for, you know, we're actually following following it on camera as well. So we know whether it's successful. We know when we fail. Weasels probably are the most trickiest uh, of all to get back into the wild. Because the, with them being tiny, tiny, tiny little things, you know, a female, two wood mice are bigger than a female weasel. Uh, so it gives you an idea of size, 60, 65 grams. Uh, so if there's any, they have to be absolutely um, perfect little specimens to go out there. And if I hand rear one from a little tiny kit, um, they don't have that um, awareness of uh, what's happening around them. And I've released them in a the garden before and they're just playing and playing around like little idiots out in the open. Whereas wild weasels don't do that. You know, they're hidden away in the hedgerows and you see one occasionally. Uh, and they're not just scampering around playing. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so they're the hardest ones to get a success story with, I would say. Yeah, yeah, it's not. It's definitely not a tricky, uh, tricky thing to do, but incredibly rewarding when uh, when it does happen like yeah, you say. Yeah. so you mentioned natural mm -hmm. world earlier so your yourself and, and the animals that you've you've worked on close to home have, have appeared on quite a few programs now haven't they yeah yeah i always like um sort of sharing the sort of stuff that i'm doing whether it be on television or social media um you know just try and get as many people enthused about uh, wildlife and especially our british wildlife because I, I just think it's brilliant you know, I'm very, very lucky that I've been to every continent in the world and I've traveled to some of the most amazing places. You know, I used to watch David Attenborough as a little child. And to think now I've been to a lot of those places uh, that have featured on these huge documentaries is, uh, you know, it's really, really special. But what I'll never, 
uh, leave and forget about is our British wildlife because it's it's as special, it's as dramatic, and uh, you know the drama that you're seeing them playing in the garden. I saw a female le weasel leave a nest with all the kits, which was just to this side of my studio. And she went off, she called them up and she went off and I just thought, I wonder where she's going. So I headed out this side of the studio just to see where she was going. And she popped through the grasses and uh, then I heard all this squealing and more squealing. And she'd actually taken the, the kits that were 42 days old. And uh, she went to take them to a rat's nest, uh, to raid a rat's nest as their this was their, one of their first outings. <laughs> oh my God. And you thought she'd, she would start them off uh, gently. Because, um, you know, a big female adult rat, if she was wanting to protect those uh, little, uh, you know, a little young, uh, it could have all of a sudden turned out very bad for those young weasels on their first outing. But they, uh, I went to one area where I could hear the screen and I just parted the grass and there was a monumental battle with one of the male weasels. And a young rat that was just slightly bigger uh, than it. Uh, an absolute battle ensuing as a part of the grass. And just never seen anything like it. You know, how a weasel, uh, I've hand red weasels, so I know how they hunt, but it's a full, full wrap round grab. They use the front paws. They want to deliver that uh, killer bite to the back of the neck, and that's what they're trying to do. But they're also using their back, back paws uh, and feet gripping so it's a full wrap round experience <laughs> uh, that, they, that they give and they twist and turn uh, trying to avoid uh, being bitten by the rat themselves because uh, it's you know rats have you know tremendous bite on them and they're uh, watching them twisting and spinning and gradually the, uh, the, sto uh, the weasel managed to subdue the rat and to kill it but it was just like <laughs> incredible thing and just in the grasses just a bit further away there was another one of these little stories playing out where another weasel had caught another another rat uh, and it was just an incredible thing to see and I just then I just thought well come away and leave them to it now I'd love to be able to film it uh, but it just wasn't the sort of time I just nipped out and witnessed this complete and utter drama going on and I've seen the cheetahs taking down gazelles in Africa and this was up there it's as special as seeing that this was it was quite incredible it, it is a mini Serengeti in your back garden isn't it in fact for anyone's back garden really yeah. it's it yeah 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 whether it's the insects uh, the mammals the birds there's so much happening we've got now and I've lost count now but about 80 or 90 cameras here on site and uh, so we've got them in tawny owl nests, barn owl nests, kestrel nests, and just those three species. Throw a squirrel in there as well, and the jackdaws, stock doves. Just those dramas that you see within within just a short periods of time, where one barn owl might fly into another one of uh, the kestrel's nest box, and then this whole <laughs> scenario starts unfolding where. You know, the, the tawny owl then gets upset because the barn owl flies into, you know, escapes from the kestrel, flies into another nest box. The tawny owl comes in and has a go at the, the barn owl. And it's actually a barn owl from last year's brood. But the tawny owl then goes uh, to the barn owl nest box and then actually takes revenge on, on that and knocks the barn owl back into the nest box by its head. And it, it was actually the wrong barn owl. They're <laughs> blaming the wrong barn owl. Well, literally within a few minutes, all of this sort of stuff can unfold. And then you've got the jackdaws vying for the nest sites as well, stealing eggs, sometimes stealing chicks uh, of the kestrels. So it's absolutely, <laughs> it's gripping. And uh, we've got monitors uh, displaying all this sort of uh, uh, behaviour. Look, baby barn owls on screen at the moment here, second brood. Um, oh, wow, yeah. Sometimes the parents are roosting in here or in the top of my workshop there. So, uh, so we're able to keep, it's a lovely day out here there today. So the, the barn owls are just roosting in the wood at the back. So they're just not on camera, the adults. Yeah, so they, there's, they, there's always stuff happening. Yeah, that's how you want it, definitely. And if someone wanted to become a, a wildlife artist now, what kind of advice would you have for them? Uh, the, the, the main bit of advice is to actually know your subject and uh, I actually study a subject um, 
you know, don't sit at home just like copying stuff out of books and things and magazines, actually get out there, study a subject and uh, get to grips, even if it's just, you know, even if it's just the sparrows in your garden, there's so much available wildlife wise for us. And, uh, and possibly don't always do the obvious thing. You know, I'm a, you know, I've got to make a living, I've got a business to run. But sometimes the most fascinating things I've done is just drawing a wasp or, you know, when I was younger, uh, you know, finding little things, you know, shells, you know, start off, I used to start off drilling feathers, skulls, um, and things like that. So actually know the anatomy of your animals as well. Uh, and now, know how they're put together. You're not going to be yeah. able to draw one. That's <laughs> So you know the anatomy and how they work and how, how the sort of joints work and things. Uh, yeah. But that's that's the main that's the main thing for me is actually knowing knowing your subject, uh, but also not there's more enjoyment that way and actually knowing not just yeah literally learning it inside out whether it's a call if you hear a bird call it's like oh that's a bird call well what bird is it you actually learn all of that and um, I've learned it the old fashioned way is actually just watching, uh, taking it all in. There's a lot a lot of easier ways to learn it nowadays with uh, recordings and films and such like. But my, my favorite bit is actually uh, being outside, actually absorbing all of nature and then uh, start putting it down onto, you know, onto canvas or to board or whatever, yeah. No, I'd agree. It's, it's similar to wildlife photography, really. I'd, I'd say the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. You can know how to use a camera, but you've got to know know about your subject, and that's going to greatly greatly help. Uh, well, before we go, I think we should find out uh, whereabouts your your gallery is in North Yorkshire, and if people want to find out a little bit more about the sort of work that you do. So, you you said North Yorkshire, yeah. But yeah whereabouts are you? Yeah, so I live up high up on the Yorkshire Wells, uh, which uh, start again. <laughs> <laughs> so I live high up on the Yorkshire Wells in a place called Fixendale. Uh, so it's a beautiful area, uh, chalkland area. Uh, so it's not far from York. And then we've got uh, across all social media on all the platforms. And you just look for my name, Robert E. Fuller. And the E is quite important. You might pick up a, uh, an old actor, cowboy actor. Um, but we're, uh, we've got quite a good following now. So uh, we should be easy to find. Okay, just check for weasels and not, not uh, Smith & Weston. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, no problem. That was Robert E. Fuller telling us a little bit about his craft and exploring his passion and profession as a wildlife artist. Now, I was thinking, what can I do for a top five today? Now, I talk about wildlife gardening quite a lot in this podcast. You'll, if you flick through, most of the people that I chat to in some shape or form are wildlife gardeners. So I thought, let's do five things that you can do to improve wildlife in your garden. And the first one, and I, and I would arguably say the most important one, is dig yourself a pond. Get a pond in your garden. It doesn't need to be massive, the size of a sink would do. Washing up bowl, something like that, would be absolutely fine. And you know, if you can't dig into your garden, even if you just put a bowl of water out, a couple of rocks, a couple of pond plants, you'd be amazed at what would take up residence. Uh, I'm lucky that my garden, it's not huge, but it's not too bad. And I've got a fairly large pond uh, in my garden now, and I'm really pleased with how, how it's looking. The amount of biodiversity it improves, because there are just some animals that you just simply won't get in your garden if you don't have a pond. And of course, all animals need to drink, so there's a focal point for that. So get yourself a pond. It doesn't need to be huge, just get a pond in your garden. Now, one habitat that's in decline in a lot of gardens in favour of fences is bushes. Bushes are really, really good, partly because they don't create a hard border between gardens. Most animals can fit through gaps in bushes. They provide refuge for things like sparrows and small passerine birds. So having some hedgerows and bushes in your garden are really important. Now, I've got wooden fences in mine, but I have actually planted some wild hedging. I've got wild privet, hawthorn, blackthorn, uh, buckthorn, all the thorns, uh, maple, all these different kinds of wild trees and hopefully they're going to kind of grow up and create a little bit of a mini hedgerow, but a mini wild hedgerow. So they're really handy because there's lots of species that will live in that and species that are kind of plant specific, whether it's butterflies feeding off the flowers or the caterpillars uh, feeding on the leaves. 
Then you've also got the birds eating the berries on them. So get some bushes in there. They also provide great cover against predators. Now a wildflower patch uh, is good. Now again, I've gone a little bit over the top in my garden. That I've got my, my entire front lawn as a wildflower patch and I've just planted that up. But even if it's just a plant pot, just something with some, some wildflowers is, is really good. Wildflowers are, 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 are fantastic to have and I'd always recommend native ones. But the thing with native wildflowers is they don't uh, produce nectar for very long. So you've got to really pick plants that are going to flower throughout the year. So for example, I've got things like snowdrops, daffodils, bluebells, because they flower slowly throughout the spring. And then I'll pick things like cowslips, which flower early on. And then maybe later on in the year, you've got things like devil's bit scabious and ox eye daisy, which have a slightly longer flowering period. You always want some kind of flower in your, uh, in your little meadow so that the nectar-loving insects like bees and butterflies have got something to feed on. So have a little wildflower patch. One thing that many people don't think to put in their gardens is a hibernaculum. And that's basically somewhere for reptiles and amphibians to, to hibernate in. It's really simple to do. You just dig down. Uh, ideally, 60 centimetres is, is perfect, but you could get away with 30. Fill it with rocks, with logs and things like that leaf litter and then cover it with a little bit of soil make sure there are some little gaps so things can bury into it that will greatly improve the amount of frogs and newts that you've got in your garden if they've got somewhere to hibernate safely and keep it a stable temperature it doesn't necessarily have to be right next to the pond i've put mine next to my pond but you could have it anywhere in the garden they'll find it and they'll use it and it also adds up as a great bug hotel as well now, the last thing I'll mention is bat boxes. We always have bird boxes in our garden, but few people think to put bat boxes in. Typically, as long as it's higher than six foot, you know, higher than things like cats can reach uh, on your on a tree or on your house, that's absolutely ideal. I've not put mine up yet, but at the side of my house, I am going to put a few bat boxes because in the summer, I was enjoying watching them uh, come down to my pond and take insects. So I don't know what species they are, probably Dorbentons if they're taking insects off the water, but you never know, so that would be brilliant. So get a bat box in your garden. So that's five relatively simple things that you can do to improve wildlife in your garden. Now, next week, I am joined by the one and only Sophie Pavel. We are gonna be chatting a little bit about beavers. I know she gets bombarded with beaver questions, so we're gonna be talking a little bit more about her career, how social media influences young nature enthusiasts, and a whole range of other quirky and interesting subjects. I'm really looking forward to that chat. This has been the Bearded Tits Podcast. I've been your host, Jack Perks, and I will catch you in the next one. Cheers. <laughs>